This is my fifth video commenting on the Constitution, on the liturgy, and giving you. Chapter 3, after, of course, the Mass, the, the, the Great Sacrament, Chapter 3 talks about specifics regarding the other sacraments and the sacramentals, and reminds us in the first paragraph that the purpose of the other six sacraments, as well as the Mass, is to sanctify men, humans, to build up the body of Christ, and finally to give worship to God. So, this, this may not have been properly read by a lot of folks, because the purpose of the sacraments is primarily to give worship to God, the worship that we owe Him because of our creation, our redemption, and our sanctification. And then, of course, in our process of worshiping God, if our intentions are correct, we're in the state of grace, we are sanctified, and we are brought together in the body of Christ. There are signs they are also instruct. So they presuppose our faith, but by words and objects they also nourish, strengthen, and express our faith. That's why they're called sacraments of faith. They impart grace, yes, but the act of celebrating them most effectively disposes us to receive the grace in a fruitful manner to worship God and to practice charity. So this is a both-and type of proposition. So, we should all understand the sacramental signs and frequent. Come together frequently, often, with eagerness, the sacraments intended to nourish our life, particularly the Eucharist, but also the other sacraments. And there are also sacramentals, which are sacred signs that have a commonality with the sacraments, but are not sacraments themselves that of their use both signify and effect grace. Now, they signify effects of a spiritual kind obtained through the church's intercession, and we are disposed to receive the sacraments and the effects of the sacraments. Uh, so, for instance, when we prepare for Mass, for instance, by reciting prayers, and uh, making the sign of the cross with holy water. Those are sacramentals that get us ready to receive the grace of the Holy Eucharist. So, the liturgy, if we're well disposed, of the sacraments and sacramentals, sanctifies almost every event in life. Remember, the seven sacraments are designed to meet human beings for this encounter, uh, encounter with Christ, in his church, between us, between us human beings, and Christ through the church. And they, they go to every aspect of our lives. For instance, penance goes to the fact that we sin against God and against each other, and it gives us relief from that peril that our souls are in, especially mortal peril, if it's been a serious sin, intentionally committed. So, and for instance, sacraments of healing meet us when we are sick. The uh, anointing of the sick. So, the Paschal mystery, that is, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, is the creator of the grace, and the sacraments then and sacramentals, to a certain extent, access, give access to the stream of divine grace flowing from the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. There is hardly any proper use of material things, then, which can't be directed toward sanctification of men. So, food in the Eucharist, uh, healing in the anointing of the sick, and in the sacrament of reconciliation, and the like. Now, they acknowledge that into the rites there have been things that have snuck in or have been intentionally put into them, features which render their nature and purpose kind of obscure, especially to the people of today. 
who are not nearly as well educated as the people perhaps of 100 or 200, even 300 years ago with respect to these issues. So some changes are necessary and we adapt them to the needs of our own time. For instance, and when I celebrate a baptism, I am always very careful during the rite to give instruction as to why things are being done and what the various signs are signifying. So, in 63, they say, Mother Time, yeah, you can do sacraments and sacramentals, and almost always we celebrate these in English or Spanish, depending on the tongue that the people speak. And that's, that's A. In B, uh, they, they need new rituals that are in English or, or Spanish. And they're adapted in regards to the language employed to the needs of the various regions. And all of those have to be approved by the Bishop's Conference. And in English-speaking uh, countries, there is a kind of a uh, coordination between, for instance, the people, uh, the, the bishops in America and in Australia and South Africa in England and Canada so that we use common translations. And the catechism, now this is thrown in here in 64 because uh, the sacrament of baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist are the initiation rites into the church where one is accepted into the church and obtains membership in the body of Christ. So the catechumenate is to be restored. Boy, this was a paragraph that just that led to literally thousands of pages of manuals and rituals and so forth. It goes back to the early centuries of the church in which it took time to instruct people who wanted to become Catholics or were inquiring as to membership in the Catholic Church. So we have uh, the OCIA, which is in our parish used for nine months to 12 months to initiate people into their membership in the Catholic Church. Then this next page here has all the way from 65 to 75, some information about mission territories and uh, with, with respect to the initiation rites. That some things they're already doing in certain mission territories can, could be incorporated as long as they fit in. So the baptism of, re, of adults, right, would be revised. Not a lot. And a special mass for the conferring of baptism, we hardly ever see that because almost all of our initiations are done at the Easter Vigil, the proper place for the initiation. Uh, then we have a revised rite for the baptism of infants. I don't think I've even seen the new book and should be adapted to the, for those who are in fact well below the age of reason. Generally speaking, between the, the birth and age three, we use the baptism of infants, right? And older children have their own uh, system for uh, kind of an adolescent uh, in, input into the church. And the baptismal right can, does contain variants for occasions when you've got a lot of people to be baptized and a shorter right to be used by catechists who, in the absence of priests and deacons, are uh, bringing people into the church. And then, of course, by the faithful in general when there is danger of death. And uh, in place of the right called the order of supplying what was omitted in the baptism of an infant, a new right has been drawn up and what it really does is it uh, adds all of the various beautiful rituals that accompany the baptism of infants. So that if an infant has been baptized, say, in the hospital by one of the nurses, 
then that can be, in a sense, regularized, although that baptism is completely valid, regularized in the church. Baptismal water may be blessed, and uh, we, all, we have new rites for those who've already been validly baptized that gives them confirmation and the First Eucharist. And typically this is also done in the context of the Easter Vigil. And confirmation may be given within the Mass when convenient. And it's almost always given within the Holy Mass. For the Sacrament of Penance, Reconciliation, the rites have in fact been revised and are very beautiful and certainly not in any way threatening. The anointing of the sick, and this is where we see that name being substituted for extreme unction, uh, is not just for those who are about to die. Usually when a priest shows up, uh, that automatically, con <laughs> back in the 50s, it automatically converted people's heads to say, oh, there's, there's death about to happen. And that's not necessarily true anymore. So whenever there is a threat to the life of an individual by a disease or certainly an injury, uh, it should be applied. And then, uh, so th that whole rite has been changed and is very beautiful. Then they talk about the ordination rite, the marriage rite, which has been completely revised and I think, it, I think it's awesome. Uh, it's been really changed a couple of times since, uh, since the Vatican Council. I know when Carolyn and I got married, we used the one that was uh, implemented shortly after the Council, and it was then revised again, and is, uh, is a, a third, if you will, a third version of the ritual. So matrimony ordinarily being celebrated within the Mass, unless the um, unless one of the spouses is not Catholic. The sacramentals in, uh, are have been revised. Some of them didn't need a revision. For instance, the Holy Rosary did not need to be revised, and nobody would recognize it if it were. But some of the sacramentals have, uh, have been updated, certainly, all put into the vernacular. And the rite of consecration of virgins. This was pretty much gone out of use because women who wanted to remain virgins for life were typically directed to go to a religious institute. But there is this now. And there is a beautiful rite for the consecration of virgins. Um, also religious profession, they changed that around. And by 1965, when I made my profession with the Marianists, uh, there was a provisional rite in place in English that we used. And it was within the Mass. Uh, finally, the burial of the dread, that uh, rite has been revised and is awesome uh, all the way from the uh, the prayers for the dying all the way through the interment after the funeral mass and uh, there is of course a separate rite for the burial of infants so this ends this chapter on sacraments other than the Mass and sacramentals.